All right, well, I guess in that case, let's get going. Um, all right, so we've been talking about parallelization um, of databases in the last couple of lectures. Uh, the main thing we've been focusing on in the last uh, the last two or three the last two lectures has been execution of uh, just queries in parallel. So your your data is static, it's fixed, and your goal is to basically uh, exploit the computational power of lots of different devices in order in order uh, to make your query run as efficiently as possible. Um, Today we're going to break into a new topic, uh, but first, uh, just a quick recap. Um, so the, at least from my perspective, the, the big challenge, uh, the thing that really makes um, computation difficult in a parallel setting, uh, in query evaluation, is joins. Um, and so we talked about a number of different strategies uh, for performing uh, joins in a parallel setting. Uh, we talked about a block nest basically adapting the block nested loop join, as well as several strategies for uh, performing equi joins in a distributed setting. Now, uh, the vast majority of joins that you want to perform in a distributed setting are going to be equi joins. So this, this hash join strategy um, is, is pretty much the, the central uh, theme of, of a lot of parallel database systems. Um, but at the same time, there's some, some situations where you actually do want to compute, um, let's say, inequality joins. And for those, you do need to go with a block nested loop join, uh, but there, uh, as we talked about, there are various strategies for preemptively uh, eliminating certain blocks of that computation uh, if you've organized your data appropriately. We're going to take this idea of a hash join today, and before we get into distributed transactions, I'm going to talk about one more join strategy uh, called the bloom join, which is essentially sort of an extension uh, to the basic hash join um, approach. Or I'll even think of it uh, in another way as, as sort of a, 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 a pre-filtering for equality joins. So uh, in order to uh, describe this, uh, bloom join is, is basically based on uh, a technique called bloom filters. Uh, quick show of hands, who's encountered these before? Okay, good. So this is uh, new stuff for most of you. Um, so a bloom filter is, is basically a technique that allows you to summarize a set of values. And this summary is much smaller than the overall set. And it allows you to very quickly determine whether an element is a member of that set or not. It won't give you a 100% uh, correct answer, but that sketch can be used to massively speed up uh, checking to see whether an element is a member of a particular set. And we'll see how we can use that to uh, implement a join algorithm uh, fairly efficiently as well. And so essentially what we're gonna, the, the strategy that we're gonna take uh, to implement that join is, is going to be to uh, use bloom filters in order to, to figure out, uh, it, so if we're doing an equi join, essentially we're trying to find out uh, which tuples, uh, which if we only consider the keys, uh, we can sort of create a set out of the keys uh, that appear in tuples on both sides of the join. And our goal is basically to find uh, all of the, the tuples, all of the keys that appear uh, on both sides of the join. Um, and we're going to use bloom filters in order to uh, speed up that process a little bit. So let me, uh, let me define bloom filters a little more concretely. Uh, let's say you have a set of data values, A, B, C, and D in this case. And each of those data values, uh, you want to construct a set out of those. Um, so in this case, we're going to have a single set. It contains um, all four values. And we want to be able to very quickly check to see whether any of these values are part of that set. And the way we're going to do that is by generating a hash value for each set element and then performing a bitwise OR on each of these. So um, basically, the, the Bloom filter itself is going to be basically the, the, or, the bitwise OR of the hash value for every set element. So in this case, uh, uh, one appears in uh, the hash, the second position for the hash function of both D and B. You get a one there. 
Um, in the third position, there's a, there aren't any ones, so we, can, uh, we get a zero there. And so this, this blue filter is basically just going to be the, the bitwise or of all of the hash values. Is that clear? All right. Now, let's say we want to uh, split this one big set up into two smaller sets. So we have one set containing A and B, one set containing C and D. We can do the same thing. We can uh, generate a filter for each of those sets. So in this case, uh, we build one filter uh, containing the OR of all of the, the bits of the hash of A and uh, B, and a similar filter uh, containing the OR of the hash of all bits of C and D. Now let's say we want to test to see whether a particular data value is a member of either of these sets. So we have this, this uh, filter 1, which summarizes set 1. We have filter 2, which summarizes set 2. So we're going to take those, and we're going to try and see whether A is a member of either of those sets. Now, obviously A is a member of, of set 1, but could A hypothetically have gone into the construction of set 2? Can anyone see a way of, of disproving the fact that A did not go into, uh, sorry, can anyone uh, come up with a way of proving that A could not have been used to construct filter 2? This bit? Yeah, so because this bit is 1, that bit is 0, it's not possible that A is a member of set 2. And to make that a little more concrete, uh, you take the hash of A and you do a bitwise AND with the particular filter in question, and then determine whether that's equal to the hash of A. So uh, basically you pick out the bits that appear here, and you want to make sure that those bits are all set in the hash value. In this case, A is, uh, A is present in 1, those two bits are set, but not present in 2 because that bit is not set. Uh, right, so it can't have participated in the construction of F2. It can, however, have participated in the construction of set 1, uh, so filter 1, uh, so it could be a member of set 1. So let's look at the hash value of each of these. Um, B and C are pretty much the same. What about D? Does anyone see something strange about D? What, what, uh, which set, based on the, these filters, does D belong to? Hmm? Exactly. So it could belong to either, um, because there are two bits in D set, and both of those bits are set in both filters. So D could potentially have participated in the construction of both. So that's basically the conceit of, of uh, Bloom filters. Um, they guarantee that you'll never receive a false negative. So if a Bloom filter tells you that a particular element is not a member of uh, a given set, it definitely is not a member of that set. On the other hand, it may produce false positives. So it might tell you that a value is in the set when in fact it isn't but it can be used to reduce the number of candidates. It can be used to filter out uh, the set of tuples, uh, the set of, of uh, elements that are definitively not part of that set. So how do we use this for, um, to perform a join? Well, the, the basic strategy is going to be, um, is going to be executed uh, when we have two different sites, uh, two different nodes, two different machines, basically two different uh, computational units, uh, each of which is storing half of the relation. So we have uh, a relation R and we have a relation S. We're joining them, performing some equi-join on them, and each of them is stored uh, on a different uh, site. And the, the rough algorithm is going to be that site 1 is going to generate a blue filter um, for all of the join keys in R. So it's going to pick out the key columns uh, that are being joined on from R, and then it's going to hash all of those and generate a bloom filter for all of those tuples. It'll then send that filter over to site 2. Site 2 now has uh, a very quick way of figuring out which join keys don't appear at all in R, 
And because of that, it can filter out, it can preemptively filter out uh, tuples that it knows can't possibly join against any tuples in R. So it's going to get this Bloom filter, it's going to look at all of its tuples, and any filter, uh, any uh, tuple of S that, whose join key doesn't appear in that filter, it simply won't send it. If the key does appear in the filter, it'll send it. Now note that even if it sends a tuple that doesn't actually match anything, uh, all that's happened is that Site2 has wasted some amount of work. And if Site2 has wasted a little work, well, that's unfortunate. We want to minimize that but it doesn't actually impact the correctness of this algorithm. So now once site one has all of the tuples that it needs to, uh, all of the tuples that it can join against from S, uh, it just, all it needs to do is perform uh, a simple local join. Is that clear? Any questions on this? Great, okay. Um, now, is there any situation where um, so does anyone see sort of a, a problem with, with the Bloom filter? Does anyone see, um, so uh, in what situations, uh, so what, what is the main advantage that the Bloom filter is giving us in this case? So S doesn't have to send all of its values. And how does it, um, so uh, going back a, a slide or two, what was the, uh, what was the sort of downside of, what, what kind of incorrectness can you get from a Bloom filter? False, False positives. And does anyone see how a Bloom filter uh, how, how to sort of figure out how many false positives it would be giving you. Or put another way, uh, what happens if you have a small data set? Would you expect to see a, a small data set that's going into the Bloom filter? Would you expect to see a lot of false positives? No. no. Why? Sorry? Right, so you have very few bits set to one, and the likelihood that you get a hash that has at least one, uh, one bit in the filter that is set to zero um, is relatively small. Uh, what happens as you add more and more values to the Bloom filter? It gets, yeah, so it eventually converges uh, to all ones, in which case it's going to tell you that everything is a member of this set. So, um, so um, under what situations will, so this, this algorithm, um, how is it potentially, uh, okay. Um, okay, so the, the basic downside of a Bloom filter is that it produces false positives. And the more false, po uh, the bigger the amount of data that you're trying to describe, the more uh, likely it is that the Bloom filter will essentially fill up. As you've noted, a Bloom filter that is completely full is entirely useless to you. Um, so there are a couple of different strategies for um, sort of ensuring that this doesn't happen. Now the first of those is that you want to g adopt a, f a hash function. You want to sort of scale the number of one bits that the hash function produces for you. If each hash function is going to fill up 50% of the uh, of the of the available bits, then that's going to lead to some some difficulties. Uh, does anyone see a problem with having a hash function that generates too few ones? If you have too many ones, the, the Bloom filter will fill up much more rapidly. What happens if you have too few ones in, in each hash value? So what's the, what's the test for membership? How, how, do you just, how, how do you test for membership in a Bloom filter? Bitwise end, but uh, you're, you're essentially testing, uh, or what are you testing? Uh, 
to, to see. With the, what is the end giving you? It's, it's telling you something about the bits of the filter. Okay, so you're finding all of the ones uh, that appear in both the hash and the filter, and you want those to be the same, right? So what happens if you have fewer ones? Right, so you also get more, more uh, sorry, not false negatives, but um, you get more false positives because you have fewer chances uh, to run into a, a mismatch. So you only get information from every, every one that's, that appears in the hash. So typically you'll want to sort of uh, find a hash function that, that balances these two. And one, one strategy that's in, that is, is used is to end multiple bits of the hash together to sort of scale the number of bits that, that appear in the output. Uh, the other strategy that you can use to avoid uh, having your, um, your bloom filter fill up is to simply use a much bigger bloom filter. Uh, and the sort of rule of thumb here is that you want to use about um, you want your filter size to be roughly proportional uh, to the size of the set that you're trying to encode. In fact, typically, it's not just uh, on the order of n. You actually want one bit uh, for every set element, uh, one bit for the, the entire size of your set. Is that still smaller than the than transmitting the entire? Excuse me, than transmitting the entire set over? Unless yeah, unless your set consists of individual bits. Um, this is still typically more efficient. So, okay, um, that's basically the idea of bloom filters. Uh, are there any questions on this? Uh, bloom filters and bloom joins. Uh, are there any questions on that? All right, great. Um, let's move on. Yes? Uh, so, So the, the, the general strategy is, so uh, site 2 is basically going to send every single tuple that uh, matches the bloom filter to site 1. And then site 1 is basically going to perform a, a, a local join, uh, is going to join um, R, which it has locally, against all of the tuples that uh, S has set. Now, if it happens that one of those tuples doesn't match, you do the same thing you do in a normal join, which is discard the, it just doesn't produce an output. So S, it's okay if S sends more tuples than it needs, than it needs to. Um, or I, I should say, it's undesirable, but it doesn't lead to an incorrect answer. So it, that, that's, uh, a false positive will cause you to waste work, but it won't actually cause you to produce something the, uh, an incorrect answer. Uh, out of curiosity, would a false negative cause you to produce an incorrect answer? Yes. yes. Why? Does it not uh, have a member in R Yeah. So it, it would, if a, an element of S should join against an element of R, uh, but site 1 doesn't have that element of S, then it can't produce all of the outputs that it needs to. Okay, uh, any other questions on, on bloom joins? Do we, do we use uh, simple bit by standard bit by R for uh, getting the bloom filters? Or are there better than Yeah, uh, bitwise and is, yeah. Um, the methods are too primitive. Bit by standard bit by R are too primitive. Oh, why? I mean, it's uh, something that most processors implement pretty efficiently. Is it just that it's so simple or? Yes. Yes. Uh, simple is typically better if you can, uh, as, and, I mean, this, this holds everywhere. Uh, if you can do something in a simple way that it also happens to be more efficient, win, win all around. Um, and this happens to be one of those cases. There's, uh, the, generating the filter is exactly a, a bitwise or of all of the hash values. Um, it's also something you can do in, in a linear scan, so you, you only need to see one tuple at any given time. Just pour it into the filter. Um, I mean, I suppose if the filter is particularly large and you have a really sparse, uh, a really sparse um, hash value with only a few ones, 
maybe you could do something more clever, but I'd be willing to bet that any sort of infrastructure that you build up to get a more complex, uh, to, to get something more complex, uh, the cost of performing the computations for that infrastructure is going to outweigh any benefit you get. Um, but, but if you can come up with something, then um, the academic community would love to hear about it. So don't, uh, don't, take, my, uh, don't take my negativity as, a, uh, as, a, as being negative. Um, okay, any other questions? All right, uh, so moving on, um, the next general challenge that we're going to try and overcome is uh, dealing with data that's changing. So everything we've talked about so far assumes that the data is, is static. When you, when, you get, uh, when you ask a question about some of the data, uh, you're going to get a, an answer that is based on uh, data that hasn't changed, data that is internally consistent. So really, we have to deal with uh, two. Um, th there are sort of two classes of, of things that will happen in a distributed setting. Uh, so you have partitioning. So there's there's data, different uh, disjoint data that is stored on different nodes, and a transaction uh, might need to update uh, multiple objects, uh, some of which live on one site, some of which live on another. Um, alternatively. Uh, you might also see situations where um, data, we talked about this a little bit, uh, but when, when data is replicated, you see essentially the same problem. A transaction is going to have to update one value, and now that's uh, for, for performance reasons or for redundancy reasons, that value might be replicated uh, to a number of different uh, additional sites, and you want to make sure that those additional sites um, get those replicas at the same time. What this leads to is two sort of high-level uh, challenges uh, with respect to the asset guarantees that we'd like to provide. Uh, the first of these is that we want all of these sites uh, to agree on that particular... Uh, when a transaction commits, we want to make sure that all of the sites are updated simultaneously. Um, we don't want one site to uh, update its... So as a, a sort of simple example, Say we have two sites, and B, and A has some data values. Let's call it uh, A has some data values. B has some data values, and now we have one transaction that is going to this way. So we have two transactions, T1 and T2. And T1 is going to uh, write to A, write to B, and then commit. Now let's say A and B are both stored on two different sites. So what will happen now if transaction 2, um, so we'll have essentially two different events for that commit. So we'll have commit some, some event that commits A. and we'll have some separate event that commits B. Now, essentially the challenge here is that we want to make sure that these two operations happen as a single unit. Because if transaction two comes along here and reads, reads B, and then comes along here and reads A, We want to make sure that this is not allowed. Does everyone see uh, what the problem is here? The value of B is integrity. Right, so B is not, at this, point, at this particular point, B has not been uh, yeah, committed, depending on how, how you want to look at it, uh, transaction two will be seeing an older value of B than it should be seeing. What? Sorry? Uh, I, I, okay. Um, so that 
I should I, I should have been a little more clear on which consistency model we were using. So if uh, if we're using um, uh, if we're using uh, a strategy where we verify after the fact. Uh, um, if we're using a strategy where we um, only perform all of the, uh, uh, where we do all of the writes afterwards, um, this is my commit time, then this is not going to work. Uh, and you're right. The uh, the other, I mean, the other situation is is this, which is a more traditional uh, consistency violation. Uh, but either, either way, the, the, the difficulty here is that we have, uh, we have data stored on many different nodes. So we have the, the sort of more traditional consistency issues, um, but as, as we'll see in a moment, there's additional challenges that arise from the fact that uh, A and B are going to be stored on two different nodes. Great. Uh, the, the second challenge is going to be that um, we want to ensure that, uh, so the, we're called durability, the, the big challenge of durability is that, um, the big challenge of durability is that we want to ensure that once a transaction is reported as having committed, it will actually commit. And uh, the, in order to provide durability, we need to deal with a couple of new, uh, new issues, namely, uh, network partitions and the fact that now we have a situation where some of our data, uh, some of the sites storing our data uh, might fail while others uh, continue to run. And I will get into that in a couple of slides. So, okay, the isolation guarantees, as I, as I just said, the, the sort of traditional strategies uh, for doing um, interleaving of queries are pretty much, uh, you can use them largely unchanged. Um, the two, by far the most common uh, strategies in, uh, in query pro distributed query processing are going, going to be various forms of locking and also often use, very often used uh, are, are versioning schemes. Uh, versioning, again, is, this is pretty much, uh, you can apply it with very little change. Um, but locking actually gives us uh, a bit more of a challenge uh, because now deadlock detection uh, becomes much more difficult. Let me give you an example of that. So let's say we have uh, two different sites, kind of like uh, in that setting, where transaction one is waiting for transaction two to complete uh, based on some operation that it performed on site one. But now transaction two uh, is waiting on tra transaction one to complete uh, some operation that it performed at site two. Now each of these sites locally uh, can, it has, uh, this is a perfectly legitimate weights for graph. And this is a perfectly legitimate weights for graph. So neither of these sites locally uh, can decide that there is some sort of deadlock condition. Um, on the other hand, the there's some sort of global, if, if you take all of these values together, um, you, you realize that there is, in fact, a cycle in the weights for graph, and something should be done about it. Now, sort of one naive strategy would be to take everything and, and put it into, uh, put the entire weights for graph onto one machine. Does anyone see a problem with that? A single point of failure, uh, but even if the node doesn't fail, there's still a huge problem with having every single uh, lock acquisition go through a single uh, a single machine. That machine it better be really really fast. Um, this essentially causes a huge scalability issue because um, just putting everything onto a single site. Is, is going to lead to that one site. Uh, yes, it's, it's a point of failure, and that's, uh, that's bad. But even worse, that single site is, is going to need to be sufficiently fast to handle everything, which means there is some hard threshold 
uh, for how far your system can scale. And as soon as you exceed that threshold, everything collapses. Um, now, a, a slightly less, uh, less naive strategy for, for doing this would be to have uh, each site sort of periodically uh, inform a central server um, what their weights for a graph is. So you do the, the decentralized locking as before, uh, but now each site is going to sort of periodically update uh, some sort of central coordinator uh, with uh, information about uh, what sort of locking exists. Uh, now this reduces the load on that central server, uh, but it's still going to lead to um, that central server being uh, potentially overwhelmed. So can we scale this out even further? Well, one solution would be to uh, sort of take these, uh, rather than having each site coordinate directly with all other sites uh, through a single machine, uh, have each, each site uh, organize them into sort of a hierarchical structure. Have each site very frequently uh, communicate uh, or detect weights for uh, cycles in the weights in the, the, the weights for graph um, at each level of the hierarchy uh, with increasing times as you go up this hierarchy. Uh, so you have, uh, let's say, a rack of servers that uh, communicate very frequently, let's say every 10 seconds. And then this rack of, of, of servers is going to send its local weights for graph um, up the chain um, to maybe the, the row of the entire row of servers. Uh, and that's going to happen once every minute. And then the entire data center is going to be checked uh, once every hour. And then maybe the entire world will be checked once every two or three hours, where all of your data centers will communicate. Uh, so does this sort of solve the scaling problem? Well, it, it kind of does. Um, but does it, does anyone see, see sort of a problem with, with this general structure? What, what's, what do you need to do in order to make sure that this, uh, this structure is, stays efficient, stays fast? So what, what, what would be the potential slowdowns in, in something like this? What would you have to, under what conditions uh, would you incur some sort of cost? Or what kind of costs could you incur uh, from a, de a deadlock detection algorithm? So what are you trying to do? Detect deadlock. So we've we've already uh, so this this general solution stays scalable for the amount of cost to detect the deadlock. Uh, but now, uh, what is what is uh, how do we get that scalability? We're we're essentially uh, forcing we're essentially uh, adding latency uh, to to the cost to some cost. We're adding latency to the cost of detecting, uh, sorry, not the cost of, uh, we're adding latency to the actual detection process. So what happens if you have a transaction that, to use the example where you have the hierarchy, where the hierarchy is server rack, uh, row of server racks, data center, world. What happens if you have a transaction uh, that spans two data centers? And that transaction conflicts with another transaction that spans two data centers. How long it will it take to for that transaction to be detected? Exactly. So the there's there's um, this hierarchy uh, basically uh, gains scalability by introducing latency uh, into uh, into detecting transactions in deadlock. Uh, that span higher levels in the hierarchy. So essentially you want this, uh, the, this works best, or I guess I should ask you, uh, what is the best situation uh, 
what is the sort of ideal uh, way of deploying this particular strategy? What, what do you have control over? Just let's start with that. What do you have control over with this strategy when deploying the strategy? Okay, so communication time. What else? Exactly. So you can control where, uh, how that hierarchy is, is organized. Um, it doesn't necessarily even have to be something like a rack. It doesn't have to be connected to the physical layout of the servers. It can be entirely uh, structured on some logical properties of your data. How would you want to manipulate? Uh, so let's start. Let's start with with each of these in turn. Um, how how would you? So what can you do with the um, with the different latencies. What does adjusting a latency up get? Uh, what is increasing uh, one of one of the, the latencies get you? Number of hierarchies. The number of the hierarchy I'm not sure I follow. The total number of peers. Okay, so let's let's say you keep uh, the hierarchy fixed, but you very let's say uh, the the lowest tier now communicates at twenty seconds. What does that what does that do? It increases the latency of detection. Of detection. Uh, what it, does it provide you with a benefit? So what is the reason for introducing this this delay? Reduce the number up to the top layer. Well, here we're only talking uh, the the lowest tier is is basically going. Uh, we're talking. To, to stay with the same example, we're talking about all the servers in Iraq. The, the number of servers in Iraq stays constant. But uh, what, is, what is the benefit of, of let's say, uh, why, why aren't they communicating every nanosecond? Why, why aren't all of the servers exchanging wait for graphs every nanosecond? Okay, so there, there's some, uh, what if, there's some, uh, limitation on um, on how fast this this can be. Uh, what is that limitation? Okay, so essentially there's some there's a, a bandwidth cost and there's a computational cost as well um, of transmitting the weight score graph to a central node. So do we, do we generally want to, um, once we've found uh, a latency that gets us to the, the performance that we're, we're looking for, is there generally any benefit to, to changing that latency? Where, where would we generally want to place that latency? How, how high or low would we want to make it? Well, so the uh, this this latency is is a tunable parameter. It's, we can set it to whatever we want. We can choose ten seconds. We can choose five seconds. We can choose three seconds. We can choose five nanoseconds. Now, as as we pointed out, uh, the there's a downside to having it too low. What do you mean by transmission time? Uh, say that again. Sorry. The transmission delay for the packets to move and like the amount of time it is taking for the amount of time that is required to communicate between two servers. Okay, so you're suggesting that it's based on uh, the the latency of, of communication between the, the servers. Okay. Um, what if the the cost of, of deadlock detection is CPU bound? So the, the cost of shipping a weights for a graph over to a central coordinator is relatively, uh, for the rack, let's say, is relatively low, uh, but then the cost of actually doing the deadlock detection on the, the unified weights for a graph, what if that's high? What if, what would we want to do in, in that case? Or how, how would we, when do we need to perform that deadlock? It's expensive. Well, 
When there, well, we we need to perform deadlock detection to determine whether there is a deadlock. Check for the liveness type of that server. Okay, so there's uh, so we want to look at the performance characteristics of the server and uh, adjust the, the the latency to to basically get to the point where the server is performing as as efficiently as possible. So generally, the, the computational cost of, of detecting a, wait, uh, a, a deadlock in a weights for graph is usually very, very high. Um, so typically, we want to set this as low as possible uh, to the point where the server is still able to keep up. Because every single time it gets a new, uh, the server gets a new uh, weights for graph from one of its uh, children, it really it needs to rerun the entire uh, detection algorithm. Okay, uh, last strategy is that we can use uh, basically timeouts, and this is sort of the, um, the most, uh, the simplest strategy in, in a lot of ways. Um, basically, if the transaction is waiting for uh, another transaction to finish uh, for more than some timeout threshold, uh, it just gets aborted. Uh, now, granted, this can lead to uh, false positives. It can lead to um, transactions being aborted unnecessarily. Uh, but does anyone see sort of uh, so the, uh, the the general strategy here? Th this general strategy uh, does it need any sort of coordination whatsoever? Do servers need to communicate? Uh, sites need to communicate at all? Yeah, uh, there's there's no coordination. This. This is infinitely scalable. Um, basically, if uh, you'll, you'll never, you, you will never get a, a performance bottleneck. Um, although, granted, it leads to, to false positives. And I mean, this is this is still a very open space. If, if um, you're you're interested in this kind of thing, um, there's a lot of work being done on different strategies for. Uh, for doing locking in a distributed setting, even now. So, all right. Um, let's see. Do we have time? We have time to start. Okay. So we've talked about isolation, and in particular, the big distributed challenge there, uh, which is deadlock detection. Now we're going to talk about um, the other major challenge: ensuring uh, basically durability. So there are two. In, in a distributed setting, we have to deal with two kinds of new uh, things that can fail. Uh, so first off, the network could fail. We could, someone could trip over a plug, disconnect a router. Um, there's situations where uh, some nodes can talk to some nodes, uh, others can't. Uh, we generally describe these as uh, something called a network partition, basically where uh, some a subset of the, the connectivity between different sites is lost. The other kind of failure is that some of the machines could just crash. Um, one machine dies, and then if it dies, it might either die permanently, a disk failure or something like that, or it just dies temporarily. Somebody trips over a power cord or somebody needs to unplug a server. Um, and we have to basically deal with both of these when designing our... Um, so we talked uh, a while back about the Aries algorithm, which are very, uh, very aggressive, um, paranoid algorithm for, for doing, uh, ensuring durability. We need to now take that algorithm and, and basically figure out uh, how these two new uh, things that can fail will affect it. And this basically leads to the question of when can we, uh, how can we efficiently decide that we've, we've completely safely committed um, a, a distributed transaction. The basic strategy that we're going to take for this is called two-phase commit. Is there a, a, I think a number of people here uh, in the class are taking distributed systems. Uh, have, has that, has two-phase commit been introduced there? Yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll try and keep this uh, somewhat brief. 
Um, the, the basic strategy of, of two-phase commit is that you, rather than committing everything in, in one go, rather than just uh, saying to all of the nodes, okay, I'm ready to commit, you need to first figure out whether there's any possibility that one of those nodes uh, could potentially need to abort. So if each of the nodes, for example, is doing local validation, of, um, local verification of uh, whether a conflict has occurred, uh, it might, it's entirely possible that when we issue a commit command, uh, that site will need to, uh, will detect that some, um, uh, if, if we're using optimistic concurrency control, uh, for example, and a site decides that, hey, um, you want me to commit, but this, this uh, particular transaction uh, violated uh, its concurrency guarantees, um, we, we basically need to ensure that that site um, will, will never abort once we've, uh, once we've sort of committed ourselves to committing. So we're going to do that in two phases. We're going to first uh, query all of the nodes participating, um, get them to sort of freeze their state and, and make it uh, get their, their local state into a, a, a situation where they will never, from that point, uh, be able to abort. All of these sites are then going to report to some coordinator that they are ready to commit. And once that's happened, the site can no longer locally decide uh, that it, it's going to abort. Um, the coordinator is going to get feedback from all of the sites, and if all of the sites have successfully said, okay, we are now guaranteed to be able to, to safely commit, uh, it'll notify all of the sites and tell them that, hey, uh, okay, you can actually do perform, uh, perform the commit. So for example, if we were doing optimistic concurrency control, uh, we would, uh, in this phase, do the validate and then do the actual commit here. Um, all right, we're running a little low on time. So we will resume this on uh, on Friday. So, but any questions uh, before I wrap up? All right, great. Uh, so see you Friday, and uh, good luck with the projects. Testing starts on Wednesday, a week from now.